Well, let me take a moment to welcome you to North Star. I'm very excited that you're here today as we are kicking off a brand new series entitled Radical Relationships. I toyed with whether or not to use the word radical because it's a word that oftentimes is misunderstood. In fact, most people, when they think of radical, they think of fanatical, uh, and that's not at all what I'm talking about when I use the word radical. The word radical comes from a Latin word that actually means uh, to, the, uh, to go back to the original root of. And what I want to do in this series, as we have been talking about since January, making an impact with our lives over this next decade, I think the only way that we can make an impact is if we go back to the original. If we go back to the New Testament and the Old Testament, and we look at the original blueprint that God gave us, not only for relationships, but that he gave us for our life how to live our life, how to pattern our life, how we can become and be everything that God has uniquely designed each and every one of us to be. And so when you watched the video here just a few moments ago, you saw a friendship that was developed by two men, a relationship that had, had, has had an impact on both of their lives. And I think today what I want to do for the next few moments is I want to talk about this idea of radical relationships. And we're going to begin with talking about friendships. In fact, let me ask you a question, and I want you to be honest with yourself. You're the only person that can answer this. If you're driving down the road at 2 o'clock in the morning and your car breaks down, who would you call? Some of you are like, that happened to me the other night. Um, who would you call? Who would be the person that you would pick up the phone 2 o'clock in, mor in the morning and say, I'm broken down on this road, could you please come pick me up? Who is the person that if you got arrested tomorrow and you were in jail and you needed bailed out, who's the person you would call? Some of you are like, I'd call my spouse. No, I'm not talking about your spouse. Who is the friend in your life that you would feel confident that you could pick up the phone and say, hey, I want you to know here's the situation. Can you bring me some money? Can you help me make bail? Who's the person you would call? Who are the people that you want standing by the graveside with you when you bury that person that you love the most? Who are the people that you think, man, I hope they're standing there with me during that emotional and impactful moment in my life? You see, I think that most of us, if we were really honest, don't have the kind of friendships that I'm talking about. I think a lot of us have acquaintances. There's a huge, huge difference. I hear people all the time say on social media, I have over 5,000 friends. No, you don't. You have 5,000 acquaintances, people that you think you know, but you really don't know them, and they really don't know you. Uh, that, that's just reality. And so many people today don't understand the idea of what friendship really is and the importance of it for each and every one of our lives. And so today, what I want to do is I want to talk about what I would call the six golden rules of friendship. The importance of how you and I can not only be a friend, but how we can develop relationships and friendships in our life. The kind that are not just surface friendships, but they're deep friendships. The kind of friendships where people are doing life with you in such a way that they're, they're there for you when life gets difficult and when life gets really, really hard. So let's look at these six principles together. Take out your notes. You'll be able to write these down. I'm going to talk about six golden rules of friendship, the importance of how we begin to develop and invest in, in these relationships. The first golden rule is just simply this. Invest the time. If you want to be a friend, if you want to have friends, you have to invest the time. Now, this is important because deep friendships are not accidental. They don't just happen, right? Right? That there's something that has to be developed, and it takes time to develop deep, lasting, longing friendships. And for many of us, if we were just honest, that's part of the problem. We don't want to take the time to invest in those relationships. We don't want to take the time to invest in those friendships. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, it says this, A man that has friends must show himself friendly. I hear people say this all the time, you know, I'm just waiting for the right person to come along so that I can develop a great friendship. Listen to me, stop waiting and start doing, start being a friend and watch what happens. 
as you begin to develop a relationship with somebody and you begin to invest the time and you begin to spend time with those individuals, what begins to happen is trust begins to build inside of the relationship that you have with them. You begin to invest time and over time, a deep friendship is built. In fact, many of the people that I'm friends with in this church, uh, we've been friends for many years. My small group that I'm in, my couples group, uh, many of us have been together over 10 years. There are deep friendships that have been developed over those 10 years. My men's group that I'm in, uh, some of those men, we've been together almost 10 years, some of us six years. And it's amazing uh, of the depth of friendship that we've built over that time. And so Proverbs tells us a man that has friends must show himself friendly. You've got to be willing to invest the time. You've got to be willing to spend the time with those individuals so that you can develop the relationship. It goes on in Philippians 2 and verse 4. Do not be interested only in your own life, but be interested in the lives of others. See, we live in a world where oftentimes we're concerned about ourselves, right? We, we don't want to take time and invest in other people and spend time with other people in a way that allows us to develop these deep friendships that we're going to be talking about. In fact, let me just illustrate this for you. Uh, how many of y'all have ever taken a group photo? Just raise your hand for a second. You know what a group photo is, right? Okay. Have you ever noticed what everybody does when a group photo is taken? They all gather around the camera fighting each other so that they can see themselves. Nobody's looking at everybody else. You ever notice that? Like, you, you don't go, well, let me see what this person looks like or this person or this person. You go immediately and you're looking for yourself. Oh, there I am right there. Man, my hair, my eyes were closed. Why would y'all take that picture like that, right? It's because we are focused on ourselves. Very seldom do we not look out for our own interests and are we interested in the lives of others. And when I think about a group photo, it's a great picture of how most of us live our lives. We're not looking at everybody else. We're not worried about what's going on with everybody else. We're interested in ourselves and what's going on with us. How does this affect me? How do I look? What do I look like? And so oftentimes, we're not willing to put the time in to be able to build the kind of relationships that God has uniquely designed us to have, the kind of friendships that last a lifetime where you can be there for one another during those times of difficulties. So what do you have to do? The first thing you have to do is you have to invest the time. The second thing you have to do, the second golden rule, is you have to earn their trust. You have to earn their trust. Now, as a leader, this is something that I talk to our young leaders about all the time. Trust is earned. It is not given. It takes time. And you see, that's the thing about friendships. Friendships take time. And you've got to begin to be able to trust the person and know that, that you can earn their trust and they can earn your trust. Now, how do you do that? Because I think it's a very specific thing that you have to do. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6, listen to how it puts it. It says, many people claim to be a friend, but it's rare. And I, want you, I underlined it, but I want you to circle the word rare. It is rare to find someone who is truly trustworthy. It's saying, man, if you find somebody that you can trust, that's a rare thing. I mean, it just doesn't happen all the time. And who is that person that you're developing a relationship with that you can trust and that you know they're going to care about you and they're going to be interested in your life and not just their own life personally, right? So how do you develop trust? What, what do you have to do? There are three things here that I've written down that I want you to write down, how you build trust or how you gain someone's trust. The first thing is it's by being reliable. You've got to be reliable. You, when you say you're going to show up, you show up. I mean, you notice nowadays people say, I'll be there at this time, and they may text you moments before and say, something come up. I mean, be reliable. When you say yes, let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. If you say you're going to do something, do exactly what you say you're going to do. Don't make excuses and pretend like, well, I just couldn't do this. In fact, in Proverbs 17, 17, it says this, a friend loves you. Notice what it says. Say that word out loud together. All the time. A friend doesn't love you sometimes. A friend doesn't love you occasionally. A friend loves you all the time is what it says. Uh, and, and the way you build that kind of friendship is you build it through being reliable. But don't, not only do you have to be reliable, the next thing is, is by being loyal. This is a word we don't hear a whole lot in our culture anymore. Loyal. What is the idea of being loyal? It's, it's the idea that... You're loyal to your friends. You're loyal to the people you're around. I don't know if you've noticed this, but our culture today, people are not loyal to anything. It's amazing to me. 
I mean, I am so amazed at how unloyal people can be. I mean, fans today of football teams, right? Because I'm, I'm a football fan. But it's, it's amazing. I mean, today they're proud of their team. Tomorrow, they're not loyal to their team. They're talking bad about the, you know, everybody on the team and, and Monday morning quarterback, right? I mean, you know, they've got it all figured out. It's amazing to me how disloyal people can be. And somebody that you're going to trust is somebody that's going to be loyal. In fact, it says it this way, Proverbs 17, 70, a true friend is always loyal. A brother is born to help in a time of need. In fact, you know somebody's reliable and you know they're loyal when you get ready to move and they show up and they're there to help you move, right? That's a friend. I mean, I see a bunch of people shaking their heads. You know exactly what I'm talking about. A friend says, you know what, I'll be there. Even though you live on the third story, three, three, three flights of steps up, I'll be there to carry the couch, I'll be there to help you, I'll be there to do whatever I can do. Loyalty. Loyalty is how you build trust with a, with a person. You've got to be loyal to them, you've got to be loyal to, to each other. In 1 Corinthians 13, 7, I love the way it says it. It says, if you love someone, you'll be loyal to them no matter what the cost. See, no matter what the cost. It's going to cost me something to be a friend. It's going to cost me time. It's going to cost me energy. It's probably going to cost me some money because they're going to forget their wallet at lunch. I mean, there's just things like that that's going to happen, right? And so it, it just takes an investment. And it says, no matter what the cost, you will always believe in them, always expect the best, and always stand your ground defending them. That's a true friend. Someone who's willing to say, hey, you know what? I know you messed up, but I want you to know I've got your back. I'm here for you during this difficult time. I, I want you to know that I'm loyal and I'm going to be here no matter what happens. And I got to tell you, in my life, I've had some friendships like this that, 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 that I've had to test those friendships because maybe something happened in the relationship and I knew they were wrong, but I said to them, hey, I want you to know, I know you're wrong, but I'm your friend and I'm loyal and I'm going to be here for you. I may not agree with what you did. I may not agree with what happened, but I'm not going to abandon you like everybody else is going to abandon you. Do you have those kind of friends in your life? The kind that says, hey man, I know you messed up, but I'm still going to be your friend. The third way you gain trust is by being confident, by, uh, by keeping confidence. You got to say, all right, we're going to be confidential. In fact, let me just say it this way. We always say this, what happens in small group stays in small group. You know, don't, don't allow small group to be a place where you go and share what's going on in your life. You know, the story I heard one time of a, a, a group of men that were together, and they were going around and they were confessing, talking about sins that they struggled with. One of them tells them, hey man, you know, I struggle with lust, and I really need you guys to pray with me. I mean, it's something I'm really trying to overcome. Another one starts talking about a struggle that he's having in their life, and they're all going around sharing all these intimate and personal things, and they get to the last guy, and they say, what can we pray for you about? He said, my biggest sin is gossip, and I can't wait to get out of group. <laughs> I mean, seriously, like... Think about that just for a moment. The reality is keeping confidence. Do you have friends that you can share things with and you know that they're going to keep confident, confidential about it? They're going to hold on to it and say, you know what, I'm not going to share this with anybody. In fact, listen to this, Proverbs eleven thirteen: 13, a true friend will keep a secret. A true friend knows how to not say anything to anybody. I, I'm not going to say anything. You don't have to worry about it. My lips are sealed. I, I, you can, I can keep a secret. I can hold on to this for you. I can help you. And in, in Proverbs eleven thirteen 13 in the TEV, it says it this way. It says, no one who gossips can be trusted, but you can put your confidence in someone who is trustworthy. Someone that's trustworthy. Somebody you know that's going to hold your confidence. They're going to hold on to what you shared with them. They're not going to share it with everybody else. And that's what happens a lot of times is that, you know, you've got friends and the first thing they do, you, you're out in the, you know, I guess shopping, doing something and somebody says, hey man, I heard about this. And you're like, well, where did you hear about that at? Well, it's, you know, one of your friends shared it with me. Well, I didn't want them to share that with you. It's confidential. That's something that was confidential. Can you keep confident? Can, can you say, hey, I'm going to keep that confidential. I'm not going to say anything. Then it goes on and it tells us this. If you're going to be a friend, you've got to listen with empathy. Listen with empathy. Now, I love this one because this is one of those ones that we all struggle with in some way, Right? The word empathy, let me tell you what that means. It just means to put yourself in their shoes. That's what empathy means. Now, let me tell you why this is so important. Um, as your pastor, you can imagine, I have heard a lot of things over the years. And I know that for me, one of the things I learned early on was how to uh, empathize with other people. Just to simply step back and say, okay, 
if I was in their shoes, like, like what would this be like? How, how would this affect my life? And I got to tell you, Angela will tell you this. There have been days I go home and I say, man, I, I got to tell you, I didn't know this about this person and didn't know what was going on in their life, but now everything makes a little more sense. I, I can see why they've been struggling so hard through this situation because I didn't have all the information. And so over the years, I've just learned. I, I've been like, you know what? Hurt people hurt people. I mean, somebody comes in and starts complaining about somebody. I'm like, hurt people hurt people. They're probably hurting somewhere in their life. There's something that's happened, a pain they've experienced. But empathy means that I am not just hearing what they're saying. I'm listening to what they're saying. I'm, I'm, I'm noticing the, the nonverbal cues. I'm noticing the things that they're not saying, but that with, I guess you could say with, with their emotions, uh, I can tell something deeper is there. That's what empathy is. It's beginning to understand the person and exactly what they're trying to communicate. Guys, let me help you with this, all right? Because ladies, y'all probably have already gone there and you're thinking this. Men, how many times, don't raise your hand, okay? Don't, don't look over at the person next to you. But guys, how many times have you had your wife say to you, I don't need you to fix this? You know what? Somebody's like, oh, you're going to go there? That, well, yeah, let's go there for a moment, okay? Let's talk about it. What is she saying when she says that? She's saying, I need you to hear and listen to me. I don't need you to tell me what to do, to tell me how to fix this. I just need for you to enter in with empathy, empathize with me about what's going on. Um, I know one time Angela came home and she was all uptight about something. And I mean, I'm dealing with problems all the time, so I'm a fixer. I mean, guys, we, we try to fix things. I'm trying to fix. And one time I remember she came in and she had a really bad day at work. And I just remember I was listening to her. I was, I was just like letting her process, trying to hear everything. And, and finally, she gets to a point, I just say to her, I said, you know what? I, I can see exactly how you could feel the way that you feel. And, and it's justified. I mean, I understand why you're so angry and so frustrated. And she got up and came around the table and just gave me the biggest kiss. And I'm like, well, what did I just do? And she said, you didn't try to fix it. You just listened to me. And you told me that it was okay for me to be upset. And you told me that it was okay for me to be angry. Empathy. Empathizing with the person. I'll tell you a little funny story about me. Um, you know, because I counsel so much, people will oftentimes be in my office and they'll say, you know, I, I'm trying to help you understand the situation. They're talking to me, telling me about what's going on in their life. And sometimes people, you know, they just think the, the funniest things about pastors. They'll be like, Pastor, I know, like, in this moment, you just can't understand. But, I mean, I, it just makes me want to drink. And sometimes what they don't understand is I'm sitting on the other side of the table going, I don't, but man, I mean, with everything that's going on in your life, I'm about to the point, I'm going to drink with you. <laughs> We're empathizing together because now I'm depressed, right? I know exactly what you're going through. And you see, empathy is entering into the emotion and the pain that others feel. In fact, in James 1 verse 19, I love what he says, be quick to listen. Wow. Wow. I mean, I could just teach this one verse today and we could go home. Can, can I tell you something? Like most of you that struggle with anger, here's the reason. You're not quick to listen. You're quick to talk. See, listening, it's stopping to be interested in what the other person's saying, empathizing with them about what they're going through and the experience that they're having. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. The key to not being angry is to listen and be slow to speak. Be careful about what you're going to say, the words that you're going to use. It's always amazing to me how people will oftentimes say things that they just really don't need to say. Just be quiet and listen. Just listen. It goes on, it says this uh, in Romans 15, verse 2. We must bear the burdens of being considerate of the doubts and fears of others. Are you considerate of the doubts and the fears of others? Do you empathize with them with what they're going through and what's happening in their life? Because that's exactly what Paul's telling us here. We must bear the burden of being considerate. Let me be quiet and let me listen. Be considerate of what's going on in your life and the situation that you're facing and what you're dealing with. And so he tells us that the way that you begin to help is you listen with empathy. But then number four, notice this. I love this one. If you're going to be a friend, you've got to accept their flaws. Now, let, let me help you with this one just a little bit, because I know that in my own life, um, it, it's hard for me sometimes to see my faults, right? But isn't it true that we all have faults? 
Uh, every single one of us have failures. Every one of us have defects. Every one of us have weaknesses. Every one of us have sins that we struggle with. All of us do. Every single one of us. And listen, if you're sitting there and you think you're perfect and you don't think that like none of that stuff, you, you're just like, no, that's not me. Uh, tell you what, when you get in the car, whoever's with you today, ask them the question when you get in the car, do I have any faults? And I'm sure if you give them permission, they'll be glad to help you to see that you do have faults. But it's accepting one another's flaws. I mean, all of us have faults. I love what Romans 15 verse 7 says this. It says, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you, then God will be glorified. So accept each other just as Christ has accepted you. What is he saying there? He's saying, in the same way that God has forgiven and accepted you, you should forgive and accept others. And, you know, in in my relationships, I'm constantly reminding myself, Marty, you're not perfect, and there are awkward things about you, and there are things that probably other people don't like about you. And, and, And you have to understand that you can't fix everybody's faults, and everybody can't fix your faults and your flaws and the things that you struggle with. One of the things that I love about my men's group, the men's group that I'm in, I love the fact that we, uh, we love each other in spite of our faults, in, in, in spite of the flaws that we have. And it's amazing to me when we come together as a group of men how we'll talk about our faults and our failures and our struggles and all those things that we go through. And even though we know all those things about each other, we still care for each other and love each other. And, and we really and truly have developed some incredible friendships over the years. In fact, uh, we did a video a couple, a couple weeks ago uh, to kind of let some of them share with you like how the friendships have evolved in our small group. And I want you to watch this with me and listen to what some of them say. The way small group has impacted my life over the many years that I've been a member has been that uh, I've developed friendships and levels of trust with men in my group that uh, I don't have outside of. The way that this men's group has, has affected me and my life on a daily basis has been huge. Just the application of friendships. Truly, this, this group has changed my life. Um, this is not just a group of men meeting together every Friday morning. This is a group of godly men getting together to discuss the Word of God as well as life. I got invited uh, shortly after Hurricane Michael. I was in a bad spot. I was working all the time, just like everyone else in the community, and was invited three times before I said yes. And I came, and to be able to come and reset every week with friends, mentors, it's, it's one of the highlights of my week. But, you know, a handful of the guys, we really connected, you know, on a business level, on a personal level. A lot of us are in very different seasons of our life, but it's great to have those friendships where you can circle back around. You know, with somebody that's already walked a path with you, they can help you stay on the right path. I believe that it has sharpened my walk with Christ. It has sharpened my understanding of the Lord's love for me. Marty's hit on this a lot, that it's really about a consistent effort, not an intense effort. That these men are not just my brothers in Christ, but these men are truly my brothers. I'm not alone. I'm with other people who are going through the same things that I'm going through, the trials, the tribulations, as well as the fun and the good times that we're having. Honestly, listening to the stories of the guys, I'm one of the youngest guys in the group. I don't want to brag or anything, but they, they've lived this, they've raised their kids, and that's a season of life I'm going through right now. So it has been super, super impactful to have a group of men that that have the right values to help guide me in the direction that I, that I hope to end up, you know, when I'm their age. Don't tell my pastor, but sometimes I get more out of my small men's group than I do my Sunday morning church, but uh, we can edit that, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, of accepting their flaws. Uh, none of us are perfect, and you know if you're going to develop great friendships, you got to be willing to accept the flaws that other people have in their life, and you've got to be willing to overlook some of the things that maybe they've struggled through and they've struggled with, that you can be their friend and be there for them. In fact, I love the way it goes on. Whoops! It says, um, "Actually, it went too far." Let me go back just for a second. 
you know what? Technology. It's a wonderful thing. So you accept others' flaws, but then notice what it says here. It says, overlooking a person's faults cultivates love, but nagging about them destroys friendships. Wow, that's powerful. Like if you're constantly having to say, hey man, that bothers me. Or, or hey, you know, you get this little thing that you struggle with, like, I, you, you know, I, 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 want, I want to try to fix that. No, listen, it says, but nagging about them destroys friendships. Overlooking a person's fault cultivates love. And so you've got to overlook those flaws and those faults in order to develop the kind of relationships that God has uniquely designed us to have. Relationships that last a lifetime. Relationships that are radical and different than other kinds of relationships that you have. And that's the way you develop great friendships is by accepting their flaws. And then number five, notice this. You celebrate wins and share losses. You celebrate wins and you share losses. Now, it's just really simple. Um, over the years, because my couples group has been together so long, we've celebrated a lot of wins. We, we, I mean, this is something that, like, as a friend, you have to be able to do. Think about this just for a moment. If we're not careful, we're constantly celebrating what happens for us. It's very seldom that we celebrate wins in other people's lives. We, we celebrate the wins that they experienced, the promotion they got with their job, the new house that they bought, the new car that they're driving, the, the wins that they experience where we don't get jealous or we don't get envious or we don't get proud, but we're willing to say, you know what, I'm excited for you about what's happened in your life and I'm going to celebrate those wins with you and then share losses, the loss of the job. I can't tell you the number of times I've cried with people in my small group that have lost their job and they didn't know what they were going to do financially and we prayed for them and we prayed together and sometimes we've even chipped in money together to try to help them through a difficult time that they're going through, a rough spot in their life at that particular moment. The loss of a child, the loss of a family member, the loss of a loved one. There are all kinds of losses that come in life, and you've got to celebrate wins and share losses. Now, the win part is important to me because I don't see, and I'm just going to say this again, I don't see a lot of us celebrating wins for other people. And that's what a friend does. Man, they are the one that picks the phone up as soon as they hear the good news and says, hey man, I want you to know I'm proud of you been praying for you, can't believe this promotion happened, I'm excited, let's get dinner together, and let's celebrate this moment in your life. I mean, how many of us need friends like that? People that will celebrate the wins in our life, the good things that happen in our life, and then be there with us in times of losses. In Romans 12, verse 15, it says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. There's a season of rejoicing. I think we're great at mourning with people when they mourn, but it's a lot more difficult for us to be happy when people are promoted, when good things are going on in their life, if we're not careful, we begin to compare ourselves. We begin to be jealous of the good things that are coming in their life. And by the way, this is just a free one. Let me just tell you this. If you'll learn to rejoice in what's happening in other people's lives, your life will be a lot happier. You ever notice, like if you're only rejoicing when things happen to you, it only happens every now and then. But there are good things happening around you all the time to other people. You start rejoicing with them and watch how much more happy your day becomes and how much more blessed your life becomes because you learn to rejoice with other people. It goes on and it tells us this. Um, or, I'm sorry, number six. Bring out their best. You bring out the best in the other people. You say, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you. I'm going to bring the best out in, in your life. In Proverbs 27, verse 17, it says, Just as iron sharpens iron, so friends sharpen the minds of each other. In our men's group, that's one of the things that we do. We sharpen each other. We're constantly trying to bring out the best in each other, believing in each other and hoping the best for each other and challenging each other to live our best life, to do what God wants us to do and to be exactly who God wants us to be. And that's what friends do. Friends are there for each other and they bring out the best in each other. They're not going to be judgmental of you, but they're going to challenge you. Man, I think you can do better than that. And I want to help you to be able to accomplish that. I mean, I tell, I tell people all the time, I, I want the kind of friend that brings out the best in me. The kind of friend that's willing to say, not just, hey, you got a booger on your nose, but let me get that booger off your nose for you. Now, I know that sounds gross, but man, think about it just for a second. Like, I was, I was talking to somebody one time about friends, and, and I remember, I'll never forget this, I was coming out to speak one time, and a friend in the back said to me, they said, hey man, you got a booger on your nose? And they took a little napkin and just pulled it off. And I was like, no, that's a friend. 
because I sure ain't going to do that for you. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but you know, I mean, I, I was thinking to myself, I could have walked out here, been on stage, everybody in the audience would have been like, Pastor Marty's got a booger hanging off his nose. <laughs> and nobody loves him enough to tell him, to say something about it. I mean, right? I mean, seriously. But good friends, what do they do? They bring out the best in you. They believe the best in you. They want the best for you. In fact, Proverbs chapter 24, I mean, yeah, 24, verse 26. An honest answer is a sign of a true friendship. Man, l- let me just ask you, because we're, we're winding up here, but I, I just want to be honest with you guys. If you want the next 10 years to be the best years of your life, you've got to have these kinds of friends in your life. Who are the people that can tell you the truth? Who are the friends that can say to you, hey, when you spoke to your wife like that, that, that was a little harsh, and I, and I just want to call you on the carpet on that. Like, that, that was rude the way you did that. Hey, what you just said to your coworker, like, man, I, I'm just going to be honest with you because we're friends. I mean, man, that stung a little bit. And, and I think you could have done that a little bit differently. And, and so you just have friends in your life who are willing to tell you the truth, to bring out the best in you because they believe in you. I'm not saying to be there to judge you, to beat you down. That's that's not what I'm talking about. But to bring out the best, an honest answer is a sign of true friendship. I want somebody who's going to look me in the face and say, hey man, I'm just going to be honest with you. Here's the truth. And that's what real friends do. They're honest with you. Even when it hurts, they're willing to say, hey, let me tell you the truth because I think you need to hear it. And I really believe this, guys. And for, for those of you that are men, let me, let me just say this. And, and I, I want to say this to guys because I don't speak to men very often and I don't say this enough. But guys, when you get into your 50s, did you know the likelihood of you becoming a recluse and, and kind of beginning to isolate yourself goes up immensely? You have to fight against that. Men, listen to me. We need each other. We need friends in our lives that can help us not to do those things, to isolate ourselves from the people that love us and care about us the most. And I see men do this all the time. And I I, I watch the guys in my group as, as we struggle together, the things that we go through. And I want you to have the kind of friendships that help you to have the best 10 years of your life. People that will celebrate with you. People that will stand there with you when you lose someone. People that are going to love you no matter what happens in your life. Those kind of friendships are the friendships that God wants us to develop. And when we take these golden rules, these these friendship rules that I've talked about, and we begin to apply them and we use them, it begins to make a difference in our life and our friendships become better. And you know what? I'm I'm just telling you personally, this is just an honest thing for, for the next 10 years. One of my goals right now, as as I'm working through these next 10 years, is I want to be a better friend to my friends. And you know what I know that means? The very top one, the very first thing, it takes time to develop deep friendships. And it means that I've got to say no to some other things so I can say yes to some things that are more important to me. And that's the relationships that God has uniquely given me with some great guys in my life And I want to invest more and do more and be there for them and develop the kind of friendships that we're we're talking about. And I want that for you and I want it for your life. And so I hope that you'll take this and you'll use it and you'll apply it this week. In fact, here's my challenge before you leave today. There's one of those on there right now that you know you need to work on. You're like, you know what, man, it's the whole time thing for me. All right, so here's the goal. This week, I want you to take one of those whichever one it is, and I want you to work on it this week. I want you just to be determined to say, I'm going to give everything I can, I'm going to do everything I can do so that I can work on this so that I can be a better friend to the people that God has uniquely placed in my life. Friendship. It's important, and it's a huge, huge part of life. And when it is right, it's a lot of work. But man, let me tell you something. There's nothing like having those kind of friendships in your life. Let's pray together. Father, I think about friendship and I think about our relationship with you and the word radical just simply means um, you know rooted in the original and God every relationship we have flows out of that relationship that we have with you because you created us in your image and God you made us to be the kind of people who do life with others 
We need friendship, just like we need friendship with you. And we're going to talk about that later in this series. But I pray, God, that you would help us to, to go to the root of your word and, and to the original context of what you say about friendships and to live them out in the context of what you tell us to do. Because when we do, we build great relationships and great friendships in our life. And I pray over your church and I pray over your people here at North Star that they would do that. They would build those kind of relationships by getting in a small group, by serving on a team and, and getting to know other people and building relationships with them. That God, out of some of the things that they're doing, uh, there would be great friendships that would be built that would radically change their life. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, some of you, your struggle with friendship is because of your relationship with God. And today, I want to give you an opportunity to make that relationship right because until that relationship's right, you're never going to be successful at great relationships. And for some of you, that just means that you need to surrender. You need to just say to God, God, you know what? I can't do this on my own anymore. I've been trying, but I release it to you and I want to begin to live my life for you. And if you've never done that, I want to give you an opportunity right now, right where you are, you can just pray this prayer in your heart. Just say these words to God. Dear God, I confess to you that I've been trying to do life on my own. That I haven't allowed other people to be in my life and that's sin and it's wrong. And what I need more than anything else is I need my relationship with you to be right. And so God, I am opening my heart and my life to you today and surrendering to you, asking you to come in and be the Lord, the Master, the Savior of my life. Give me the strength to be able to live now the way you have uniquely designed and made me. If you just prayed that prayer, I want to pray for you. And I'm going to ask across all of our campuses with their heads bowed and eyes closed. If you just prayed that prayer, would you just slip your hand up so that I can pray for you? Thank you. God bless 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 you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Across our campuses, we see your hands. Those of you that are online right below me, you can click on the hand there. I'm going to pray for you right now. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for every hand that's gone up. And thank you that, God, you love us and care about us. And you want us to have great friendships. And the friendships that we develop and the friendships that we have, they come directly out of our relationship with you. And I pray that, God, you would help us to fall deeper in love with you and to live out these golden rules that we've talked about today of friendship. Help us to have better relationships this year because we begin to live this out on a daily basis. For we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people together said, amen. Hey, here at North Star, we celebrate every time people commit their life to Christ. And so as we transition back to our campuses, I'm going to ask you if you would, let's put our hands together and celebrate all those who committed their life to Christ.